Welcome everyone to Mayo Clinic Q&A. I'm Dee Dee Steepen. We're recording this podcast on September 14th, 2020. We've talked previously on this program about the ongoing vaccine trials for COVID-19. This past week, one of those trials was paused due to safety concerns. Here to discuss is Dr. Greg Poland, an infectious disease and virology expert at Mayo Clinic. Dr. Poland, great to see you. Thanks so much for joining us again. And you, Dee Dee. Thanks for being here and, and moderating. Dr. Poland, could you bring us up to date on the AstraZeneca trial that was halted? And how common is it for something like this to happen? The halting of a trial for a serious adverse event, especially in one of this size, is almost always a given. And the reason for it is that any serious adverse event raises the question of whether a trial should be halted and reviewed. And uh, uh, just, to, to, just to review, a serious adverse event is anything that results in death, any sort of uh, life-threatening reaction, hospitalization, a, a birth defect, or any sort of important medical event that would require a, a physician to intervene or else it would, would get worse. So that clearly happened in this case from, from the media reports that we have, and that's all we have is this appeared to be a case of transverse myelitis. So they have evidently resolved that in terms of perhaps this was somebody that received the meningococcal vaccine rather than the COVID vaccine. That's an easy one to resume. Perhaps it's somebody who had previously had similar uh, uh, medical conditions or problems so that they really don't blame it on the vaccine. Any, any of those possibilities would exist. But anyway, very common. Um, I've uh, been the chair of multiple DMSBs. This is routine. Um, it, it's, a, it's good evidence that the system is working properly to catch something like that, pause it, consider it. Now, now of course, they need to make that data transparent so that uh, it can be peer reviewed. But speaking generally, once a trial is stopped, what's the process? How does it get started again? Yeah, it's kind of a difficult one in reality because when there's a, a, an SAE, you have to, of course, the sponsor hears about it first. They then call the DMSB together, and then they have to report this to every uh, national regulatory authority where the trial is taking place. So, for example, in the U.S., it would be the FDA, and you have to report it to the investigators of all the clinical trial sites that are involved, who then have to report it to their IRBs. In order to resume the trial, you reverse all of that. So uh, it's actually pretty remarkable that this was done this quickly uh, in, in many ways, um, but, but not unprecedented. So when a vaccine is ready, can you explain how it's typically rolled out? In answer to your question about how the vaccine will be rolled out, they're considering at least four phases. So the first phase would be high-risk healthcare providers, the frontline people, if you will, first responders, those who have medical problems that put them at the very highest risk, and older adults who are living in, in, a, in congregate living situations. The phase after that will be uh, critical uh, workers, essential for society, who are at high risk of exposure, high risk older adults, the homeless, and what might be a little uh, controversial is people in prison and jails, followed by essential workers, kids, young adults, followed by everybody else. And the idea underlying all of that is to figure out equitable allocation because too many times in the past, there have been situations where uh, it's been the wealthier people or wealthier nations that have had access and less so for more marginalized communities. So Dr. Poland, anything else on the vaccine trials that you wanted to add before we move well, on to our COVID? The other thing that's gonna be very difficult, and it's actually the subject of an editorial I, I just submitted called the national discussion we haven't had yet, is how we're going to actually roll this out. When you think about it, we are attempting to do something that has never been done in human history. In the midst of a pandemic, multiple vaccines, many of them novel vaccines, with unique storage requirements, ultra-cold chains, for example, 
are going to be rolled out, as I say, within weeks to a month of each other, where patients and providers are not yet uh, fully informed and aware of differences in vaccines or which is the right vaccine for which patient. So that's going to be a struggle. I think the other thing is just the mass immunization. How are we going to eventually immunize, say, 350 million people, particularly when it takes two doses? We don't have that many glass uh, vials. We don't have that many needles. Um, we don't have currently mechanisms to do that over the course of weeks or months. So um, it's, it's going to be a, a, a trick to do this, and it's going to take a lot of thought. Um, let's move on to some other COVID-related headlines. A CDC study shows that dining out is likely tied to spreading COVID-19. It's yeah. something I'm sure a lot of people have been doing more and more of lately. Can you explain why dining out is so problematic? Yeah, likely for a number of reasons. So what they found is almost a two and a half fold increase uh, risk of being COVID positive for people who had dined out in the previous two weeks. This uh, likely has to do with the fact that people, if you've uh, driven by a restaurant, they are often not physically distanced. Um, of course, you can't wear a mask while you're eating, and sometimes people don't wear them regardless anyways. And sometimes you have ventilation issues in some of these small, you know, kind of crowded uh, venues. The other thing that tends to happen is restaurants tend to pump music in. So you and I don't sit across from each other and talk quietly. We have to talk loudly like this in order to overcome the music and everybody else talking loudly, meaning you're greatly increasing the uh, respiratory particles that are released. One other thing that did not come out as a part of this study, and that is that people in the context of a pandemic who are willing to go into a restaurant are also of greater probability of engaging in other higher risk behaviors, other congregate settings or of not wearing a mask. I'm not willing to go into a restaurant because I can't wear my mask the whole time and I don't trust the others around me to do so. So, you know, that puts me in a different category than the people willing to go and do that. So it's, a, it's part of a larger discussion that we need to have in our culture about what are appropriate behaviors and how to do things safely in the midst of a pandemic. And uh, I kind of related, and Didi, you mentioned it earlier, um, this name that's come about and certainly is true, this sort of COVID fatigue. People are beginning to um, give up or lessen their vigilance and their use of these simple things that are highly protective. And we're suffering from it. Uh, as you may know, yesterday, Sunday, the WHO reported that globally we had more cases reported than since the beginning of this pandemic. That's not good news. And we really need people to say, you know, hang on here for a few more months. These wearing a mask, these uh, uh, recommendations on physical distancing, they really work and they work well. Let's do them corporately together and protect one another and we'll get this under control. We're, we're in danger of losing that. Kids are going back to school, college campuses. Uh, outbreaks of COVID-19 on college campuses <laughs> are, are making lots of headlines. Can you talk a little bit about that? In fact, when you look around the U.S. and you look at the, the 25, if you will, hottest spots, 19 of them are in places where there are large numbers of college students that have recently gathered back. You know, when you, you think about it, and, and I've used the analogy before, when you think of a university bringing people from all over the U.S., all over the world, into, you know, dormitories and enclosed classrooms, that's kind of analogous to a cruise ship. <laughs> and we already know what happens on a cruise ship if you're unwilling to faithfully follow these recommendations. I fully believe that in many locations, in-person schooling is possible, but it would take a dedication and a vigilance in using uh, distancing, cleaning hands, wearing masks, 
that, that students, staff, and faculty would have to adhere to and agree to do that. That's not what we're seeing, at least as judged by the news reports. We're seeing kids crowded into fraternity parties, going off campus to bars and restaurants. And that's just a tinderbox. So that when you do that, you will predictably have outbreaks that flare up, which spread into the community, and then which just spread further and further. So um, it, it's possible to do it, but one would have to take it very seriously. What do we know about transmission among school-aged children? We know that school-aged children, absolutely transmission occurs. What, what has been somewhat more controversial is more, you know, the younger kids, if you will, sort of the child care level age. So these are kids from a couple of months old on up to school age. And there's been controversy there because there hadn't been a lot of evidence of spread. Well, we can correct that piece of science now based on a report that came out from uh, the, the CDC and the MMWR. They looked at three childcare facilities from uh, April to July in Salt Lake City. And they found 184 people that were linked to these you know, three childcare places. 31 of those 184 developed COVID. 12 of those kids, they could link their, their getting uh, infected to the childcare facility. Those 12 young kids, one of them as young as I think three months old or something like that, 12, those 12 kids that got infected spread it to 12 other people not linked with the facility. One of them was a parent who ended up getting hospitalized. This makes sense to me. It never made sense to me that we would say, well, based on age, you're somehow not going to transmit that. Now, they may transmit it at a lower risk level. That, that remains to be seen compared to adults who are more commonly congregating. But it's, it's apparent now that persons of any age who are infected, even asymptomatically, can and do transmit this virus. Dr. Pollan, is there anything else that you can think of that you want to add? You know, I guess just something that we've talked about so many times, what are, what are called non-pharmaceutical interventions. And I can't stress enough just how powerful these are. You cannot get infected with this virus if you don't breathe it in or introduce it to your eyes, nose, or mouth with your hands. Now there's great power of knowledge in that because if you're wearing a proper mask properly and wearing it below the nose is not proper, but a proper mask properly, washing your hands and being physically distanced from people, that's not the same thing as social distancing, just physical distancing. You can go about pretty much many of your activities and do so safely and keep a nation safe. And it's been uh, surprisingly controversial to get people to do that, and yet it works, and it works well. And I think we're going to have to do that unless we decide that we're willing to risk much greater outbreaks. Austria is now in their second wave. The country of Israel has now locked down. The UK has made it a law that you must wear a mask in public. These are simple things that keep not only the wearer safe, but importantly, other people. And I really do want to, you know, with some passion here, get people to realize we need to move from a me to a we culture and thinking to keep everybody safe. You know, we're now in the U.S. just bumping up against 200,000 deaths. You know, what is that? One of every 1,500, 1,300, something like that, Americans who were alive at Christmas are now dead of COVID. And those were preventable deaths. And we have to realize the gravity of that situation. You know, we do it at Mayo Clinic. We have a simple seven word motto that we live by. The needs of the patient come first. It doesn't matter whether I want to mask, wear a mask or not, or whether it's comfortable or not. I wear it to protect my patients 
to protect the other people in the facility. And it works. Our thanks to Mayo Clinic infectious disease and virology expert, Dr. Greg Poland. Thanks again, Dr. Poland, for joining us. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts. To see a list of all Mayo Clinic podcasts, visit newsnetwork.mayoclinic.org. Then click on podcasts. We hope you'll offer a review of this and other episodes when the option is available. Comments and questions can also be sent to Mayo Clinic News Network at mayo.edu. Thanks for listening and be well.